Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another Lo-Fi History here at the Cottrell Digital Studio at the Northeast Georgia History Center. We've got Marie, we've got Glenn. Oh, wait, and we have me talking. There we go, hold on one second. <laughs> wait, talk. I hear myself yet again. Aha, there we are. Now we're good. All right. I like. I, I never noticed before, Libba, but I. But when the screen changes color and like your your face is highlighted by a brighter screen. Oh, that's funny. It yes. looks like you're you're tracking the missiles and they're. It's like a ding, ding, <laughs> and it's like oh, you're about to tell us they're about to hit. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, I can see. Duck in cover. It's pretty cool because it's like. That's it's funny. like it's like war games. That's a movie from history, guys. War you games? Didn't know. Yes, from as long ago as the 1980s. Ooh, the ancient era of the 1980s. Yes. <laughs> I'm, re I'm ready for 1980s reenactors. We're there, man. I was oh, one yeah. last week, if you'll remember. No, technically I was 1990s. Yeah, last yeah. Week. We haven't quite <laughs> got to that point. Haven't gotten yet. to that point no. yet. Haven't gotten to that point, yeah. But welcome, folks. Uh, what a great way to introduce new people who have no idea what's going on. Uh, <laughs> so this is Lo-Fi History. I'm Libba. We've got Glenn and Marie here, our historians, and they are here to answer your history questions. So if you want to go ahead and chat your questions for Glenn and Marie, we will answer them the best that we can. And of course, we also have our regular folks here. Hello, Terry. Hey. Hi, Terry. Hey. Hello, Phil. Hey, Phil. Ooh. And Josh is here with us. Hey. I see we've got some more folks as well. Oh, Clavion. Hi, Clavion hey, Clavio. on Twitch. And we've already got some questions, and which we certainly will get to. But first, we always like to start out with what Glenn and Marie are wearing today. Both uh, quite different styles, I see. I'm I'm loving that hat, loving the vest. Yeah. The dress, of course, is beautiful. Oh, thank you. So let's start out with uh, Marie. Do tell, what are you wearing today? So today I am wearing a robe a la Française, which is a fancy way of saying a French dress. <laughs> from the 1700s. The Robot La Française was very popular in the mid 1700s. It continued to be popular in different variations up until around the 1780s. Some people still wore it a little after that, but really that's when fashion changed. You have a lot of revolutions going on and no one wants to look like this because people are getting their heads chopped off. Ah. Uh, it kind of looked like this. So we don't want to look like the royalty who no. are, yeah, being uh, not treated so well. <laughs> but perhaps for some uh, some yes. valid reasons. <laughs> it's, it's great to be in the aristocracy until it's not. Until, until it's, it's not. not. <laughs> so this is very, very fancy uh, 1700 dress. Uh, mine is even a, I, I'm going to stand up because y'all need to see my pleats. Oh, wow, well, look at so that. My, my pleats Woo. are my favorite thing in the back. Ah. Fancy. These are the Watteau pleats. They are very, very large box pleats. Ah. And I have like a cape. And it's yes. really fun. It's and really also pretty. my dress is really poofy. Yes, so. I love the poof. <laughs> I love the poof. But and in, and in fact, uh, Marie is going to be doing one of her popular yes. Getting Dressed live streams, one of our members' live streams, uh, with this style of dress, and that's going to be on May 7th. So if you are a digital member, you can look forward to that. If you are not a digital member yet, well, lucky for you, I have the link right here, so you can sign that up That is to remarkably convenient. <laughs> a digital member for as little as $3 a month or 35 a year, so go check that out. And uh, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one. So, Glenn, what have you got going on? Oh, just this little old thing. Little old thing. Little old thing. Some, uh, th one of the interesting things about men's fashion is that from about uh, 1810 to about 1840, it doesn't change a whole lot, yeah. right? You've got a you've got a linen shirt, you've got a waistcoat uh, that sort of really comes to your natural waist, uh, with trousers beneath that. You've got a, a cravat around your neck, and you have a wide variety of headgear. And I have chosen since the warm weather is here now, folks. Uh, I have chosen a nice airy straw hat, uh, and I. Wearing this get up first because it's kind of comfy mm -hmm. and it looks and I get to wear the big tall hat. But this Sunday, for those of you within driving distance, is Super Museum Sunday. And uh, me and uh, Monsignor French 
are going to be down in the cabin and we are going to be portraying basically Gainesville 200 years ago. What was a store like? What were professionals doing? So we will be portraying lawyers and surveyors and sellers of dry goods and other movable uh, material. So if you're local, please come to that and see us, talk to us, and find out about life 200 years ago. And the big exciting thing is that it's free admission Woo! as well. So if you are in the local area, uh, please do check that out. I'm going to put the link to, let's see, Super Museum Sunday in each of the chats. So that's a link to our Facebook event. So you can um, say that you're interested in that and it'll t it'll remind you. Yeah. All and right. if you're not local, just hop on a plane and come anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, we've, we've, so far we've had two a uh, family of, of fans from new york visit us that's that was true pretty awesome i bet olivia will be joining us soon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's also very exciting but uh so yeah you got sort of a summer 18 early -ish, yeah 18 1820s yeah. Uh, right around the the time gainesville was founded uh nice. in hall county so uh in those in those happy days of the frontier <laughs> pre-indian removal when we were all one big happy family <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, that's super exciting, especially because if you haven't had a chance to check out the White Path Cabin here, that is uh, the historic structure on site that a lot of people um, come to see. And we've got it, uh, it's, it's decked out with 1800s era uh, props and, and uh, furniture and all sorts of things to really bring the the cabin to life so you right. can check it's, that out as yeah, well yeah it's it, i love it it's it's our by far our largest <laughs> original object yeah. right it is. but it's a it's a huge original object with a lot of history tied into it but it is also a fantastic interpretive tool at the same time as, as a said we have all kinds of programs here somehow even if it doesn't quite fit in with the time period we're able to make the cabin work yeah. yes uh, somehow it yeah. is a it's a fantastic thing now I see we've also got, we've got Karen. Hello, Hi. Karen. Good to see you. Um, we've also got Alma. Hey, Alma. Good to see you again. And Laura uh, on YouTube. And Stacy is here with us as well. Uh, Make Mistakes is uh, on, on his way. He says, I'll be there in All 16 right. hours. <laughs> All right. And, and Brooke is here as well. Hi. Hi, hey. everyone. Hey. And, and yeah, if you're joining us for the first time, we'd also love to know where you're watching from. Yeah. Uh, Clavion says, Glenn, why do you have so many pancakes on your head? And now that I look at your hat, they kind of do look like a, a neat stack well, of pancakes. Well, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, the, the straw hats, they would, they would weave, uh, and they would just go in a, like a, not a cone, but a coil yeah. up to the top and then make the top. And then, you know, it's, it's, there's not that much on the inside because yeah. it's made for, for summer wear, but and yet still incredibly fashionable. Yes, <laughs> and Karen wants to know uh, what am I wearing? Well, I am dressed as a uh, 21st century uh, studio staff member <laughs> that <laughs> needs to move a lot, have have plenty of pockets. <laughs> Actually, this this is called uh, Union Alls from from the company that I've got it. It's it is kind of a retro look it kind of reminds me of like if it wasn't straight up pink then i think it'd be like a good like rosie the riveter type of yeah get up I'd, I'd, <laughs> or if it was like an olive green it would look very like late mid century <laughs> military yeah. I, 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 I thought it's it's like a cross between rosie and ripley from alien <laughs> oh that's funny i mean it's yes, it's, it's what yes. they look like they're kind of yes. cool it's my power suit that's yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, let, uh, enough of this. We got <laughs> questions. We have history. <laughs> oh, but Karen also says, my girly says, that's beautiful to your dress, uh, Marie. Thank you. Got lots of compliments for your dress. Yes. So, uh, we are, today we're going to start with, um, we have a question from Alan on Facebook. And Alan wants to know, were any of the pirates in the coast... Uh, local heroes as they would give better deals to the common people of goods than heavily taxed royal goods. Oh, that's a fascinating question. So, oh. I, yeah, that brings up also just a more general question of how did the local folks react or, or think about pirates? Because, of course, pirates are going to be in trouble with the government most of the time. Right. Maybe not the local people. So, uh, 
It depends on what kind of pirate you're talking about, right? So, so I think what you're talking about with the folks bringing in goods that are a little cheaper are are more smugglers, mm-hmm. right? They're, blockade they're, runners. Blockade runners or things like that. Their goal, a, a pirate's goal, pirates are sea thieves, right? <laughs> and they, they take their ships and they prey on other ships and steal stuff off of ships. So they are rather uh, violent and, and thieving. Smugglers are blockade runners, don't actually take from other ships. They will take uh, cargoes that they get for a good price somewhere else, possibly even legitimately, and then bring them in to other uh, secreted inlets on the coast and sell them to uh, would-be merchants without having to pay the custom duties or the tariffs or things like that. So of course, if you're not having to pay those customs duties, your goods are going to be cheaper on the open market than ones that came in legitimately. So, so people tended to really like smugglers. Smugglers tended to get very well off, and it was a very fluid. As a matter of fact, some of our founding fathers. I right? about to say some of the signers of Declaration of Independence were smugglers. John Hancock himself made his fortune because he brought in goods around the the customs agents. Uh, whether he snuck, whether he just outright bribed them, whether he manipulated the system, that's how he made his money. Now, the pirates themselves, um, local, it, it depends on what the local person was, right? If a local person is a merchant themselves, they're probably not going to like the pirates because the pirates will steal their goods that they have coming to them or that are going out, or they will create a market whereby things are so cheap that they're that you can't sell your thing for a, a reasonable price. Uh, so pirates themselves were probably not well thought of. Uh, and you have to remember, these are times where people did place more import on human life and doing the right thing than we perhaps think they did. And so they're just going to have a big moral problem with pirates anyway. And also it depends on what pirate we're talking about in which country and what that pirate's normal thing is because uh, some pirates whose the town, if the town did not treat the pirate nice or the town didn't want to pay the pirate like a ransom. Protection money. Mm -hmm. Then they might destroy the town. It happened. And those town people did not like the pirates because the pirates were extorting them, they were making them pay money for this protection or because they wanted certain, they didn't want to pay taxes. Anyway, kind of like a mob mentality situation. Uh, Like the pirates kind of are like the mob (laughs) in a sense. They're just not good people. And therefore other people don't like them. Yes, Oh, oh Jack Sparrow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can you not love Jack Sparrow? He's just, he just is so inept. But here's what's interesting. Um, for He's all those great pirate. movies, I'm trying to think, does Jack Sparrow and his pirate gang ever actually do the pirate thing? Well, see, that's that's the beauty of Jack Sparrow. He doesn't, like... They he, don't like, do the pirate thing. He, like, tries. He, like, wants to be this great captain. And you're just like, oh, Jack. But they they never go out and, like, find a ship, take the stuff, and then, you know, be done with it. In the movies. Yeah, they just get all the fun parts. It's like, now here's what, uh, we're getting so far off track, but that's okay. Uh, When my kids were younger and they would watch Jake and the Neverland Pirates on Disney, um, they had pirate rules that they're trying to teach kids to follow. And I actually took a picture of a screenshot of this because it's Jake and the Neverland Pirates Uh and they're going through the rules. And one of the rules is a pirate never takes someone else's property. (laughs) And it's like, Uh, Jake and Disney, that's exactly what a pirate does. That's exactly what they do. That's sort of the core of being a pirate. You know, I get you're trying to tell a good lesson, but I don't think Jake and the Neverland Pirates is the way to is the medium in which to transmit that lesson. That's really funny. They're just like totally <laughs> I mean, destroying right. what pirates actually are. I mean, like, you know what we want pirates to be? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Well, while we're on the subject of pirates, uh, Karen did uh, have a question of uh, who is your favorite historical pirate or literary pirate? 
Now, uh, if y'all missed our Pirate Family Day, uh, oh, then yes. definitely check that out. It's on our YouTube channel. In fact, I will get a link to that in the chat for you to look at later. It was really, really fun. Um, but let's start with uh, let's start with you, Glenn. When it comes to literary or historical pirates, who is your favorite? Who's I'm, got a good story? I'm I'm going to be boring and just go with Long John Silver, yeah. because I remember reading Treasure Island when I was very young. And um, he was the pirate, uh -huh. right? In that book, he was the pirate. And the, the, and, uh, the way Robert Louis Stevenson set him up, I, I thought was so perfect, just with this one simple phrase. You know, when they were talking about uh, Captain Flint, everyone was afraid of Captain Flint, but Flint was afraid of Long John. Uh, <laughs> right, and I'm like, right. wow, he must be one <laughs> bad dude. So yeah, Long John Silver. Nice, great, great fried fish too. Oh, yeah. really? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about it. Like, now I want some fish. Sounds good to me. Food. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Marie? <laughs> um, I think I'm going to go with Ching Shi. Oh which yes. Was one of our par pirates that we met during our family day about pirates, and she was a a female pirate. Um, from China in the early to mid-ish 1800s, and just like the best pirate. She had fleets, right? Yes. Fleets. Originally, there was the Red Flag Fleet, and then she got so many ships that she started having to give them different colors. So you would have like <laughs> the Blue Flag Fleet and the Purple Flag Fleet and the you know the Black Flag Fleet and stuff like. I mean, I'm not sure if those are the exact colors. Don't quote me on that. But there, she had to start like differentiating because she had so many. It was ships. a huge organized yeah. huge. operation, <laughs> and like she had rules. Yes, mm -hmm. she definitely had rules. It was about taking other people's stuff, but she had rules. Her pirates were very lots of discipline. There's lots of discipline going on. The ship who got the plunder who who stole the stuff would get a, a portion and then another portion would go to uh like the the main account to the main ship mm -hmm. uh and then she would distribute it so everyone would also get paid right yeah uh, so yeah uh, she was i think it was the the dutch navy the english navy the french navy as as well as the chinese government all tried to stop her and failed. Yes, which is just incredible. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. She can... got so good, the government was like, you know what, like, we can't defeat you. We'll cut you a deal. And then she just wanted to, like, live out the rest of her life. She's one of the pirates that survived. Wow. Well, and, and the pirates that did survive, almost to a person, that's how they did it. They yeah. got so big, they had to make a deal. Yeah. Or the governments had to make a deal wow. with them. And they're like... <laughs> you know what? It's easier this way. Like, right. I'm ready to retire. It's I'll right. cut a deal. Wow. It's the 1800s version of just selling your business to the highest bidder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. And uh, and yeah, you can hear uh, her story specifically mm -hmm. in our family day, as well as um, a few other pirates. So you get different perspectives. And um, so do check out the family yeah. day videos. Those are really fun. Uh, our next question comes from Phil, and Phil on Facebook asks, besides Churchill's cabinet war rooms, are there any other historic sites that are preserved undisturbed as they were left when abandoned or closed? That's a very good question. I'm trying to think of, of big places like yeah. that. Um, there was, Well, this is not that big a place, but when I was at the Atlanta History Center, there was... Um, I can't remember the name. It was basically a hardware store. Mm -hmm. And the guy who owned the hardware store retired in like 1973. Mm -hmm. And the day he retired, he locked the door and he walked away. Mm. And everything was still in that store. It's a hardware store from 19, like 73, cool, right? Though. So all the tools yeah. and the signs and the stuff, it's all still in there. I think I, I think eventually his family did liquidate everything, but that's kind of cool. Um, I know in France, and every once in a while, this pops up on Facebook, and it popped up a lot during the centennial. There was a uh, a French soldier who was, of course, you know, entered the French army in World War One and went to fought and died. And his parents, as a memorial to their son, kept his room exactly the way it was when he left. 
And that room is still that exact same way today. Wow. Like, they've, you know, they've dusted. Yeah. And oh, they've, yeah. They've, they've taken um, his effects from when he was killed in the war that they sent back home. They've put those on display in the room. But that's it. Everything else in the room is exactly as was when he left for war in 1914. Um, you know, those, those historic sites that they just turn when they just close the door when they're done and they've left them intact are very, very rare. Can yeah. you think of... Not any? as completely as, as that. There are some where it it seems like it's someone's house, like a, whether that be a president or uh, anyone else, where the, like this was how their desk was when they left it. Right. But it, it's not like the entire house or war rooms. I think it might be um, FDR's little White House in Warren Springs, Warren Springs. Georgia, yeah. where they, they had like a little bit of it where they're like, this was... This was his study when he left the yeah. last time. But it's been so long since I've been there, I can't remember perfectly right. if that's how it was. But I know just like, since he did die there, a lot of times people were like, oh, well, this is where he died, so we're not going to touch him. Right. Uh-huh. Right. I wonder, I think too, you said the war rooms. I, when I was in London, I did not make it there. But in Dover, they do have these secret wartime tunnels. Ooh. And I think some of those tunnels were more or less abandoned at the end of the war. Yeah. But they're not preserved as historic sites. And you can't visit them, right? Because they're tunnels literally carved into the White Cliffs of Dover. And I think they're dank and damp and unsafe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, you can't go visit them. But I think they pretty much shut them down at the end of the war and just said, we don't need these anymore. Yeah. I wonder if they'll ever be put to use in any way again. That's Hope not. fascinating. That was, well, not that way, yeah. <laughs> Probably we won't need more tunnels. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, our next question, and thank you for your question, Phil. Uh, our next question is going to come from Josh on YouTube. And Josh asks, uh, what if... We always love these yes. what ifs. <laughs> what if Kaiser Wilhelm never had his birth disease and had good relations with Britain? Maybe Britain would have joined the Central Powers. And for a little more context, um, Josh notes that uh, Kaiser Wilhelm had a birth disease and blamed his mother for it, and she was descended from Victoria. So he didn't like the British for that fact he has heard. Ah, no, Kaiser Wilhelm actually loved the British. Oh, uh, he know. grew up because he was uh, Queen Victoria's grandson. Oh. I believe that's right. Mm-hmm. See, that's the trouble in World War One is all the crown heads of Europe were directly descended from Victoria <laughs> in some way. It was just right. a large like, family squabble. I mean, like grandsons, like uh, Tsar Nicholas and, of course, George and Kaiser and... Um, Someone else, not in the in the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, obviously they, the British ones. Yeah, obviously the British ones. They were all that was their grandma, right? And so they knew each other, and the British and the Germans got along smashingly before the war. And their navies, even though their navies were competing, that was one of the things that led to the war was the was the arms race with the naval um, platforms and and the fleets and everything. They really liked each other, and every year they would have, like, Navy Week, and it would either be held in Britain or in Germany, and the fleets would go into their their respective harbors, and for a week they would hang out, they would tour ships, they would have contests and yacht races, and King George's yacht would race against the Kaiser's yacht, and it was all grand fun, and they exchanged uniforms, right? So during this week, like, Kaiser would dress like a British admiral. Because George had made him one. Because <laughs> okay, they're yeah. first cousins. Yeah. Um, they're just hanging out. And so it was, you know, it's this very poignant story in, um, like, is it is it June or July? Um, just literally weeks before the war starts, and everyone kind of sees how things are going. It's, one, it's that last week, and it's in Kiel in Germany. And it's very somber because the Germans and the British sailors and, and officers are all just kind of very much sad and regretful that they know that within weeks they're going to be shooting at each other. And, it, and it's all kind of sad. So I think um, by this point, it was... So, so if Kaiser loves the British, he also wants to be the German warlord, right? This is Germany's different from France or from Great Britain 
or even really from America and to a certain extent Russia at this point, the Kaiser is the embodiment and the totalitarian head of the German state, but more especially the German army. So whatever he says goes. So whoever has their, whoever uh, has his ear tells him what to do and he does it. Whereas there are other sort of safety stop gaps in the other countries. George couldn't just declare war, right? Um, the French president couldn't just declare war. Even the czar couldn't just declare war, but Kaiser could. Okay. And so it just all sort of snowballed. There, I mean, Joshua, I'm sure you know this. There are books and books written on how World War One happened, mm -hmm. and it's and it's very very complicated. But I think your question as to how personal relationships could have affected it is a legitimate what if. Because really all the Kaiser would have had to do is say, no, I don't think we'll go to war today. And that would have been it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what uh, Clavion was just like, couldn't they have all said collectively said no? <laughs> well, <laughs> not that they, easy. Well, the, the, the treaty system pulled all the other countries into war. No one thought when Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated that in six weeks all the major countries of Europe would be at war. But that's what happened. Yeah. And again, you know, we could spend weeks here. It would be low-file, long-term history <laughs> to talk about it all. Yeah. But great question, Josh. We uh, love your what-ifs. <laughs> I know. We could, it gets us going. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So our next question is going to come from Stacy, and Stacy is wondering, which first lady do you think had the best sense of style? Who were considered the most and the least <laughs> fashionable? Yes. Um, so of course this is this is a question that's, for that's Marie, Marie, I think. But if you have an opinion, Glenn, it's totally, I just totally I'll, I'll, I will put mine in two words and then turn it over to Marie. I know it's going to be. Say it. Dolly Madison. She's got it. Dolly Madison? Dolly Madison. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I would have always assumed Jackie Kennedy because everybody everybody thinks she's the most fashionable. Dolly could have won in a fight with her easy. No, I said Dolly fashion Madison. or otherwise. Mm. I'm going to find a picture of her in her, in her <laughs> regalia. All right. So if, if we're going with 1800s, definitely Dolly Madison. If we're going to get, section it off into the 1900s, Jackie O is, again, yeah. fashion icon. Don't say 1900s. It is 1900s. 1900s. It makes me feel so old. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, look, the I 1900s. was born in the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> so Dolly Madison is like the first lady. She is the one who invents the role of first lady, really and truly. That means the, the, the hostess, the... The idea of being like the hostess of the nation, starting to do charity work on her own, having some of her own political ideals that of course always support her husband, but she is taking a more active part in. Being a fashion icon, Dolly Madison. She does not get enough credit for I'm gonna throw all a that she has done. So I found a portrait of her yes. that has a nice fancy dress. So I'm gonna throw this block block blend. Is. So let me yeah. let me make this so you can see the whole image. So yeah, <laughs> fancy, fancy dress. Yes. <laughs> and she's got the fan and everything. And there's even um, I even came across it looks like a porcelain doll version of her. Let me make oh, this a little is. bit bigger. That's so, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so you can see her in color, which is yeah. very cool. And she wore really turbans cool a lot too. That was one of the things that was very popular that she popularized <laughs> was like this head wrap situation going on and made that incredibly popular throughout the nation and abroad. I mean, I'm not sure if I can credit abroad exactly with her, but, but she yeah, made it really she made popular. popular. Right. Uh, so Dolly Madison, wife of James Madison, uh, this is early 1800s. James Madison was the third president? Third president. No, fourth, fourth. Fourth president. If you split the difference, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> he was the fourth president. So before this, we have Martha Washington, of course, first first lady. But she isn't even in the White House. She's just kind of in her own. Well, home. there is no White House. There is right. no White House. <laughs> and she's left at Mount Vernon while Washington's doing president things. Yes. So she's not really like a, the hostess, the out in public person at all. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson's wife had passed away. 
mm. bef- way, way before he mm. came to office. Yeah. So he had his daughter kind of filling in the role, but her, her his daughter also had her own family. Mm. So she's not going to be as out there as you might have it. And then Ab- we have oh, Abigail, Abigail Adams, who she, is, of course... She did not brook such foolishness. <laughs> very awesome woman. Mm-hmm. Was not going to play political hostess. Uh-huh as much as Dolly Madison. So Dolly Madison gets to the White House. She's really like the first one who's like making the White House her own. There's a lot of like similarities between her and Jackie. Like the right. kind of redoing yeah. of the White House, like being very fashionable, very hostess, very charming. Mm-hmm. And Dolly Madison would use her charm to kind of get her husband's political rivals on their side. So she would take them on a tour of the White House, be like, oh, look what I've done, and now we're going to start talking politics, but you're not going to actually realize I'm talking politics because I'm distracting you <laughs> yes. with the White House. And then eventually at the end of their tour, it's like, oh, look, and here's my husband, and now you're going to talk out your problems with him. Okay, okay, bye. See you for dinner. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> so she deserves so much credit with like the behind the scenes in her working of political systems. Wow. So much. And then also just being the hostess, inventing the charitable role of the first lady as well, where the char- first lady takes on more political slash social change objectives. And then also being a fashion icon. Yeah. So she was awesome. Jackie O, of course, a fashion icon. Again, she was redoing the White House. She invited, again, playing that hostess, she invited people into the White House to go on a tour with Jackie Kennedy, which super endeared her to the American public. She was a young mom, had a, one of the, I think JFK was the youngest president that we've had ever. And he was just being young and cool and hip and being a mom. She was a mom before they went into the White House, but then um, even while they were in the White House, I think she had um, she had at least one child, and I think she also had a um, gave birth, but the child very sadly died mm. just a few days after. Oh, yeah. Or it was it was very close to mm. uh, birth and then and death. Yeah. Um, so you also have that tragedy uh, in the White House where, and then of course the tragedy of her husband being fatally right. shot and assassinated and she's she's there and being a very sophisticated woman but also a very strong woman mm-hmm. uh, just in her grief. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, th- I think that also is just very iconic um, and just the tragedy also associated with the Kennedys kind of made her a more mythical almost because you have like this legend of the kennedys and she's part of that right so i think that also kind of like makes her a fashion icon status because Mm -hmm. when what do you think of when you think of jack jacqueline kennedy you think of that pink suit that she was wearing when her husband was shot oh yeah you're right and the pillbox hat Mm -hmm. yeah and so, uh, I did find a, a little collage, just in case you want a refresher of Miss, yes. Miss Jackie O's style. So, <laughs> so we've got. Well, a, that was quite the basis for the the famous paper doll book, yes. wasn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> also, I love this fact about Jacqueline Kennedy that not that many people know. But you see her here. You see the evolution of women bearing their arms. Oh, you're Jacqueline right. Jacqueline Kennedy <laughs> was the first first lady in like a hundred years to be able to show her arms Ooh. and her shoulders. Ooh, so shocking. There is somewhere, like, if you look at her, like, from like, the beginning of the presidency, like, up to it, yeah. it's like, Jacqueline Kennedy with sleeves. Jacqueline Kennedy with, like, a one-shoulder dress. Jacqueline Kennedy with straps. Jacqueline Kennedy with a strapless gown? Whoa. What? Like, just slowly working. And it was something that they had to consciously think about mm-hmm. in her right. fashion was... Yeah. Can she can she show skin? Can she, well, and her what? husband killed men's hats. He did single handedly. K- killed men's hats. Yeah. Yes. He didn't like hats, and therefore nobody wore hats anymore. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look Basically. at the pictures, and every men wore hats. Yeah. Men wore hats from the beginning of caveman times <laughs> when they first put a dinosaur fur on top of their head until he goes into office and he's young. And he doesn't wear hats outside or inside. And people are like, hey, they're trendsetters. So people stopped wearing hats. Men wow. specifically stopped wearing hats. And 
But That's ladies it. still wore hats because Jacqueline still well, wore the yes. little hats. Well, but yeah. then those kind of go away in the, the 60s and 70s. Well, that's fascinating. I feel like women's hats hung on for the 60s and then they yeah. disappeared in yeah. the 70s. Wow. And men's <laughs> hats are just... Gone. They went, they went Baseball blues? caps have come back. That's but, true. Yeah. But it's different. Yeah. I know, but... A ball cap is no fedora. It's true. Oh, uh, yeah. Fedoras had a interesting comeback in the yes. early 2000s. Uh. <laughs> Remember those middle school days for me? I, I <laughs> Not that I had one. <laughs> I, I cringe. Yeah. See, if I dressed the way I was in high school, you two need to do that at some point, too. That's true. That's true. That would be fun. I think I still have clothes from high See? school. All right. But I, wore, I had a school uniform. Oh, okay. Well. So... <laughs> so I, ha- I I can wear I can wear my polo. There you go. Polo and khaki. Well, you can wear what you would wear to the mall on Friday night. Oh yeah, okay. there you go. Yeah, the mall. Hmm. <laughs> Next live stream history of the mall. <laughs> it's about old enough. We can go. We can go and do it on site at the mall that we have in town. We, yes. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Make mistakes says, isn't Glenn dressed in his clothes now? In his high school clothes now? <laughs> You weren't no. you weren't that much of a nerd I'm not, yet. Right? I'm not that old. <laughs> Brooke says uh, that she still wears fedoras, but Brooke, I bet you can rock them. Yes. <laughs> Me, not so much. <laughs> not a not a good sight. So, uh, oh, we all, we have another uh, similar question. So Karen has a good question. So how how important was fashion with the children of the White House? Did they also mm. set trends uh, and was would that have been a bit later in sort of the presidential timeline or or what? Mm, that was a very interesting fashion. question because not all presidents had children and not all of them had children with them in the White House. True, yeah. So the children were kind of off doing their own thing. Uh, presidential fashion for the wife, I would say is pretty important throughout. It, throughout. They're going yeah. to be setting trends. They're going to be, uh, fashion also can be political. And a lot of women also engaged in that. It's a form of self-expression for women. Uh, and so therefore you have certain things. So if you're emulating the, the president's wife, well then like, are you supporting them as president? You know, uh, but, legitimizing their power. Uh, but the children, we don't really, even to this day, we kind of shield the children of the president away to where they aren't going to be fashion icons they're not in right. media spotlight mm-hmm. um, if they're still living with their parents right yeah yeah, yeah. so that makes sense. I, I would say there there's really not that much for presidential children in the limelight at all and if there are um it's very rare the only one that i can think of that like continuously made ha- headlines a little bit more um to the, where the president had to like address his child's behavior was theodore roosevelt and his daughter alice mm. To no, where I don't know that back. scandal. <laughs> oh, Alice just did whatever Alice wanted to. Woo! She, she like, uh, there's... A... Theodore's like, I can't control her. <laughs> you you try and you see how you do, but and I can't do it. I'm going to be ignorant said... for a second, but, but Roosevelt, that would be what you... The uh, early 1900s, this okay. is Theodore Roosevelt. Yes, yes, yes. okay. Uh, so, and he had like eight children in the White House. Oh, wow, yeah. They were, like, sliding down banisters and had, like, <laughs> right. a horse in the White House, oh, like, brought their pony to ride down the hall. <laughs> wow. Like, it was, a, it was a little bit of a zoo. They had a lot of animals and a lot of kids. Good times. Good times. Yeah. Uh, but to the Alice was one of his older daughters. Might have been the oldest. I, I can't remember exactly. But uh, she did whatever she wanted. And Theodore Roosevelt literally, and I quote, said, I can run the country or I can control Alice. I can't do both. <laughs> I mean, just look at just look at this woman. I mean, that's <laughs> she knows that. what's up. That's right. She like, does. She's going places. She's not she's not gonna say no. She's no. daring you. <laughs> yeah. Like she's come daring. at me. <laughs> It's pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I think Alice is great. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> now, uh, I mean, did she just, like, not sort of act the part of what she was expected? She didn't do anything, like, terribly, terribly scandalous. No, scandalous. she was, yeah, yeah. she was tomboyish. She was her and, life. Outway, yeah. <laughs> very cool, parties. very cool. Yeah. Nice, nice. She wasn't, you know, burning wagons as they no. crossed the Potomac or anything like she that. She wasn't, you know... Her robbing trains. Yeah, right. no. Or no. being a pirate. Yeah, no. right. Yeah. <laughs> Blow up bridges. None of that. Nothing no. like that. Just for a society lady, she was behaving unsociety-like. I see. Um, 
and people had a problem with that. Uh huh. But uh-huh. she did not. I, her and Juliet Gordon Lowe probably would have partied hardy. Ooh, I wonder if they had ever met. Oh, that'd be mm, fun. That would be I'd a good look one. Yes. That. Yeah, very cool. Uh, our next question comes uh, from Josh again, and let's see. So we have, uh, what if <laughs> during World War II, the Nazis moved their entire forces to the Eastern Front to oh. prevent them from getting too much and letting the Allies get to Berlin first? Now, he does provide some context as well. Uh, Josh also says that some Nazi leaders realized the Allies would be a bit nicer with them than the Soviets and tried to work with them. Of course, moving all your troops to one side would be noticed, but maybe Hitler wouldn't have they, noticed? No, a lot of the high command in Germany talked about doing that and wanted to do that. Mm. The only re- For the reasons you say, they were, you know, everyone realized that surrendering to the Americans and the British was going to be way better um, than it was to because the, the Germans had done some bad things in the Soviet territories. Very bad things. Very bad. And the Soviets were bent on absolute revenge. Mm. And they so they lost the most per capita per country. Yeah. Yes. And so and, and so Hitler though at the highest level Hitler would not allow that to happen just willy-nilly. Willy he wouldn't say just let the uh, western allies come on and put everything into the east. He wouldn't let them do that. And they suggested that. But what happened is um, on a more localized scale there were um, German units fighting the Soviets so that their other uh, forces could go west as fast as they could specifically to surrender to the Americans mm-hmm. or, or the British, right? So there so there are German forces fighting on the east to let other German forces go west and surrender and sort of holding that line. That's what ended up happening since since Hitler wouldn't let the, um, you know, everyone go and fight the Soviets, some units stayed there so that more people could go. And of course, the Soviets found out about this, and they got really hacked off. But the Western Allies are like, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're surrendering, mean? right? They're they. Why don't they want to surrender to you? We don't know. We think you're great. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to keep taking their surrender. Um, but there was conversation too about about taking Berlin and whether um, the Allies could get to Berlin before the Soviets. And again, the scale and the national drive amongst the Soviets to get to Berlin and take it, it's hard to overstate that. It was overwhelming. That's how they knew they were going to win, is if they got to the beast within the city of Berlin. That's what they said, the beast of Berlin, right? So... um, at a certain point, Eisenhower himself says, the Soviets are going to take it. For us to try to take it before them or at the same time is going to cost resources and men that we don't need to, to lose. So we're going to hold on this line and let the Soviets take Berlin totally. And later on, he said that was one of the biggest mistakes he made. Mm-hmm. He said, I was right militarily. Militarily, I still think that's a good call. But politically, I didn't realize at the time how important it would have been if we had taken Berlin instead of the Soviets. Yeah. But the Soviets did get Berlin, right? And so, the, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> as they say. A very good what if. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A very so almost what if. Uh, yeah, almost yeah, exactly. yeah, that's more they were, accurate, they were, right? They were kind of close to doing that. Yeah. And that one is very much like this almost happened. Yeah. <laughs> it could have changed so much. Now, um, we don't have any more uh, questions in the chat, but I have some questions for y'all. Uh, okay. So we do have about uh, a little over 10 more minutes, guys. So if you want to have any uh, more questions answered, put those in the chat. Yes, and do we have any of our questions from last week that we couldn't get to? Oh, I don't know. Oh, we, we have addressed... I don't think we did, because I, I usually put them in here, and okay. they're so I think we're good. All right. But here's a question. So I was wondering, how novel or new was the idea of having a right to free speech, like, prior to the American Revolution? I mean, where, where did this idea of, I should be able to say what I want appear was it did it was it present in, a, in any strong way in government before that 
that concept, the ability and to speak one's mind and thoughts goes all the way back to the ancient world, all the way back to the, to the ancient Western world, the Greeks, uh, and then eventually the Romans. They never uh, codified it like we did in the First Amendment. But just, you know, philosophers themselves, and Socrates was like, you know, you, the, the, the free exchange of ideas is absolutely crucial to a civilized people, right? To, to be able to, to say things, to express ideas, that's how societies move forward. Intellectually, technologically, politically, socially. I know that sounds stupid. That's how societies move forward socially. Uh, but, but yeah, so that idea does go all the way back. And of course, it sort of, you know, fluctuates through history based on what government we're talking about, what time period we're talking about. And the British were, um, the British Constitution and British rights did lend itself to an idea of freedom of speech, but history had shown that the British government and monarchy was way more willing to suppress something that it considered a threat. Right, they used to order, uh, for, for example, one of the things that really hacked the Americans off and they made sure it didn't happen after independence were uh, writs of attainder. I I've never heard of that. Writs of attainder basically were legal documents given to a magist- uh, issued by a magistrate to people who were going to carry out his will and basically said, go enforce the law that I say. And writs of attainder were basically arrest warrants that had blank, they didn't have blanks on them, but it was, you can arrest anyone who you think is doing a bad thing. Whether it's speaking ill of the government, whether it's sneaking goods, whether it's smuggling, it's everything, right? It's it's a blank check wow. for um, police action is mm-hmm. what writs of attainder were. And we put a stop to that pretty hard when we gained independence. Um, which is, you know, to a certain extent what the, the, the Fifth Amendment is all about. Uh, to a certain extent the Fourth, but especially the Fifth, is you have to have processes for the judicial mm-hmm. uh, system in the United States. You have to be charged specifically with a crime. Your warrant, if, it, if they're going to search you or if they're going to arrest you, the warrant has to state a person specifically and a specific charge. It can't just be this willy-nilly stuff. Yeah. Um, so, but, and, and freedom of speech ties into that uh, from the American sense. We, we do sometimes think of it as a very American thing. And, you know, the British rights system and constitution still hasn't codified freedom of speech. Really? It's not. I didn't know that. And see, when we say the British constitution, the British constitution is not a document like we have that's uh-huh. written out, it is the precedent body of law in Great Britain and tradition which means it's open to interpretation. I had a friend who was studying law while we were abroad at Oxford and it was driving him crazy <laughs> that they have nothing written out. It's literally just all like, he was well, like, it's like all tradition. Right, I don't know how to find it. They don't have out. one document. It's, it's the entire body of British law. It's not, here is the constitution right. and the bill of rights. Yeah. Wow. And of course, with that much precedent, there's going to be a lot of overlap. There's going to be a lot of contradiction. So nothing is necessarily guaranteed. It's whatever they want. Yeah. I mean, you could right. make it like that. The, the, but yeah. there's a very, in very strong times, sense of tradition. Right. There's, there's, it's a more progressive approach in Great Britain, but in the 1600s, 1700s, and really 1800s, they could, they didn't like hearing something. They could squash it. Wow. Hard. Yeah. yeah. With those writs of attainder. Writs of attainder. <laughs> yeah. I had never heard of that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yay. <laughs> and now we do have some last questions uh, before we end today. And um, Karen wants to know, what historical things will we be doing during our summer time off? Well, time off. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Karen. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're actually, you know, we do have our, we announced that we're having our summer slow down as far as live stream goes. So you're right, Karen, that uh, during the summer, we are going to be um, hosting reruns every Wednesday of our favorite live streams over the last year or so. And then all new pre-recorded members programs every Friday. 
But we're doing this because we actually have quite a busy summer and we are going to have a, first of all, we have three virtual summer camps. Yep. The first one is Colonial and Revolutionary America and that's in June um, and information is available uh, on our Facebook page. And we also have our uh, World War I camp and World War II camp in uh, July. So, virtual summer camps. And then we have our Chautauqua series. Uh, Marie, do you want to talk about our Chautauqua series? Yes, so our summer Chautauqua series, our Chautauqua, if you don't know what that is, is a series of three different talks uh, around the same theme. So our theme this year is healthcare heroes. We are going to be looking at different healthcare heroes throughout history. We will be hearing from Crawford Long, a good Georgia boy here on June. He will be our first Crawford Long. And if in case you haven't heard of him, he's, he's rather famous around these parts, <laughs> but perhaps not all around the world. And, but you should know of him because he was the one who first used ether as a sedative during surgery. So, that you don't feel pain right. and don't have to like process <laughs> your surgery while it's happening. Right. If you don't like being awake when you get operated on, think Crawford Long. <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Of course, there's also the ether controversy because yeah. uh, there was another person who like first publicly demonstrated it. Kind. Well, they published it first. They published first, but Crawford Long had better evidence over a long period of time because yeah. he didn't want to publish and then be like it don't work right <laughs> it only worked the one time so he wanted to make sure it worked a lot therefore he was the first to do it and prove that but was just not the first to publicly demonstrate it right uh but eventually he did right after the other person did and was like look i did it first and i have more backup evidence <laughs> to back it up all right second of off we have dr mary walker in july and Dr. Mary Walker is the first female surgeon in the Union Army during the American Civil War and also the only woman to be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So we are going to be hearing about her and her medical journey during a time when there are not a lot of women doctors at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and also her military service and being the only woman to date to be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yeah. So super cool woman, super cool. Uh, we will be hearing from her. And then third off, in August, we will be hearing from E.E. E. Butler. Our History Center is located right off of E.E. E. Butler Parkway. Very famous here in Gainesville. He was an African-American doctor, very um, famous in these parts uh, for his uh, treating of the African-American community here in Gainesville. Cured a lot of flu, delivered a lot of babies, and you know there are still people. And he op he uh, operated, <laughs> he practiced uh, in the you know 30s, 40s, 50s, and a little bit in the 60s. And so there are still people around today that that went to see Dr. Butler. Yeah, yeah. So you'll get to hear some uh, local history as well as uh, national history as well during our Chautauqua series, and that is on site here at the History Center. Um, and well, there might be a way for us to, to do that. There is a virtual component. Yes, virtual there is a virtual component, component yes. for all of our members. Yes, yes, for our members. <laughs> <laughs> We're a member. So, uh, so yes, we are. We're going to be also making new webisodes. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar with our webisodes, do check them out on our YouTube. Uh, we do all original, uh, educational, and very entertaining videos um, for all audiences. But of course, our main demographic is students. Um, so we have, and then, and then just getting ready for the next academic year, right? right we're we're right. looking at developing new characters and, yes. and getting some more folks in to help us out. So, yeah. so some of that you don't see, but but you know, all of that you support. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll we'll have a busy but exciting summer, yes. definitely. Um, I think we will end on this question today from Laura. Uh, Laura is curious about DC statehood. How was it founded and how hard would it be to make it a state? Ah, this Great is, question. This is in the news. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very relevant. News. The um, history meets current day. Yes. Because really it's just one long continuation. Yes. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> the idea was when the District of Columbia, Washington's city, was created that it would be an area that would be neutral in government affairs, right? Uh, it would not 
become so populated as to hold sway because people knew that the capital city was going to become inhabited by financial creatures, political creatures, uh, those seeking favor, uh, members of parties, uh, all those things. And, and they knew that it would become a sort of a den of corruption and vice. And so they wanted to not give it any say in the federal government. They wanted the federal government to sort of be its own thing, at least in this particular area. So that was why the District of Columbia was created. It is constitutional that that would be, uh, you know, they didn't call it Washington, D.C. or the District of Columbia. They just said a capital city will be made uh, for the new nation and it will not have representation in Congress. So for that to move forward, um, there, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. Nor am I. Nor, nor are any of us. But the way I understand it, the Constitution states what the dis what the capital uh, district will be and what the representation will be. If it is going to achieve uh, representative statehood, uh, first the question becomes: Does it meet the requirements as set forth in the Northwest Ordinance to become a state? Second. Since the Constitution addresses this uh, capital district, would an, a constitutional amendment be necessary to to grant uh, to basically counteract what's already in the Constitution? Getting constitutional amendments uh, altered or put through is obviously a very, very difficult thing. We haven't had uh, even a try since the Equal Rights Act of 1980. <laughs> I can't remember. I'm sorry, but it—I mean, but it, an amendment to to state that women and men have equal rights in America that couldn't even get pushed through. Um, so you know, will it happen? Who knows? I think if they do it by the book, it's going to be a very, very long and possibly unsuccessful act uh, or attempt. Uh, but you know, who knows? That's, that's future land and not history land. <laughs> I, I can tell you why, why folks didn't think it was a good idea for it to be, but I know that, that times sometimes change. Yeah, indeed. Well, uh, great question to end on today. And uh, Terry had one last question. Can adults take the virtual summer camps? <laughs> I know they sound like a whole lot of fun. Uh, and But we have, uh, and I mentioned this in the comment, we've, we've talked about maybe having some future programs where it's it's geared for adults in a more like workshop style. So, right. you know, bring those ideas. Tell us what you want because we do have a, a long list of <laughs> <laughs> of. of maybe ideas so uh yeah we, we've even talked about just having like uh you know either on site or for our broader audiences like a, a zoom seminar on a subject yeah where, yeah where we wouldn't just come and, and lecture forth to you we would actually encourage a conversation to take place back yeah and forth. so so we've we've got lots of ideas but uh you know we uh, being what four or five of us <laughs> here, yes. yeah. it's uh, we gotta we gotta pick and choose. But we right. love all of you for uh, being here and supporting us. Thank you so much to all of our members and all of our viewers and all the people, our regulars. Uh, thank Absolutely. you so much for being here, and we can't wait to see you again next Tuesday for our next uh, Lo-Fi History, and. Um, be on the lookout for those reruns and our members programs since those are going to be uh, really really fun and also i want to give a shout out to everyone who's helped us reach um our april donation goal we we had it at 200 dollars as our goal we extended it uh and we ended up uh, so far we've got 230 dollars um there's still time there's right. still time to maybe <laughs> reach that extended goal of 300 so if you want to want to help us out there we really appreciate it but more than that we appreciate uh your support and being here so we will see you next time everybody take care Bye. bye, bye.